Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to ARA's Webinar Wednesdays. I'm Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. It's entitled, The Effect of Moving Dynamic Loads on Pavement Deflections and Back Calculated Modulus. This is part two of a program. Uh, many of you, I'm suspecting, joined us for part one, which was, was our July webinar program. Next slide, please. I'd like to first begin by covering a few housekeeping items with you. I'll introduce our instructor, turn the program over to Dr. Lee, and then I'll be joining you for the Q&A program. Uh, so first of all, um, a couple of housekeeping items in the next few slides. If you have an issue with the sound during the webinar and you're using your computer speakers, please dial in using your phone. If you have an, an, a different issue with the webinar, Please click on the chat button at the top of your screen and send the note only to the host and we'll do our best to try and assist you. Next slide, please. If you have any questions, please click on the Q&A button and send the question to both the host and the panelist and we'll address the questions, as I mentioned before, at the conclusion of the technical program directly after the presentation. And we normally allow about 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the length of the presentation, to address Q&A issues. Next slide, please. To view the presentation in full screen at the top of your webinar, click on the down arrow, highlight view, and then choose to fit the viewer. Next slide, please. So a brief introduction of our presenter today, Dr. Young Lee. He also presented part one of the program. Young is um, a senior research engineer with the Research and uh, Technology Development Group at Applied Research Associates in our Chicago office. He holds a PhD in pavement and materials engineering from Michigan State. Uh, Young first joined ARA in 2006 as a staff engineer, and he worked full-time for a while in Florida Department of Transportation and then rejoined uh, ARA in 2015. Dr. Lee has over 15 years of experience in the field of pavement evaluation, structural analysis, forensic investigations using NDT methods uh, such as falling light deflectometer, ground penetrating radar, and several others. And now it's my pleasure to present our presenter, my good friend, Dr. Young Lee. Young? Thanks, Jerry. And thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us today. Um, again, the title of uh, today's webinar is Effective Moving Dynamic Loads on Payment Response and Performance. This is part two of a two-part webinar series in which we will talk about payment performance with a focus on mechanistic empirical IRI prediction. So with that said, here are the two learning objectives. The first objective is to understand the difference between mechanistic empirical IRI prediction versus purely empirical IRI prediction methodologies. And the second objective is to understand the advantages and disadvantages of the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction method for practical use in payment design and analysis. So here's the outline of my presentation. I'll start with a brief introduction and talk uh, very little bit about the finite layer method, the visco wave, which is what I used for um, for all the simulations herein. And we'll talk about two different methodologies for simulating the payment response, namely the fixed point analysis versus the moving frame analysis. And then I'll show you a couple of vehicle models for simulating the vehicle dynamic loads. And then finally, we'll get into the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction. Before I go forward, um, for those of you that have attended part one of the webinar, this outline may look quite similar. And yes, and yes. Are, there's, there, there's some overlap uh, between part one and part two, and I do apologize for that. But 
we felt it was necessary to make this part two webinar independent of the part one webinar. So please be patient with me. So why are we concerned with pavement? Because in reality, there is no pavement out there that is perfectly flat. And in part one of the webinar, we looked at how some of the rough pavement profiles may generate some serious vehicle suspension movement as well as some um, dynamic loads. And we also uh, looked into some the challenges associated with uh, the analysis and back calculation of the data collected from some of the traffic speed deflection devices. But apart from the analysis challenges, why do we want our pavements to be smoother? Uh, because from a user's point of view, smoother pavement means more comfortable ride, it's safer, and it uh, the vehicle operating cost uh, becomes less on smoother pavement. And from an agency's point of view, smoother pavement means increased uh, pavement life, which also means less maintenance and reduced life cycle costs. And for these reasons, pavement smoothness is considered as one of the most important factors affecting both the structural and functional performance of payment. So how do we quantify or how do we assess uh, payment smoothness? There's probably uh, many uh, uh, smoothness indices that are being used um, as of today, but the International Roughness Index, or shortly the IRI, is probably the one that is most frequently used across the globe. And the IRI is actually calculated from a mechanistic simulation of what we call the golden car. And golden car is nothing more than a quarter car with some specific parameters. And the IRI is calculated as the accumulated suspension motion of the golden car um, normalized by the distance traveled. And because smoothness is such an important um, factor of payments, there have there has been a, a vast amount of past effort uh, trying to predict uh, the future IRI of a given pavement or a given pavement network. But most of the time, these um, prediction methodologies were based on empirical um, um, prediction uh, models, um, mostly uh, in the in the form of a regression um, regression equation, uh, with some of the examples shown here, but. The limitation of these empirical uh, prediction methodologies or empirical models are that they only take um, limited number of independent variables, um, such as the initial IRI or IRI zero and payment age. And there is no direct link between these models and some other payment distresses. And most of the time, these empirical models require some expensive calibration. And then there is the IRI model that is being used by the Ashtoware uh, Payment ME. And this uh, IRI, IRI model is a little more sophisticated in the sense that it was developed for the premise that the surface distresses have a significant effect on ride quality. So here is the empirical IRI model um, in Payment ME, and you can see that it takes into account the initial IRI, as well as other distresses, such as rut depth, fatigue cracking, transverse cracking, and the site factor, which incorporates payment age, as well as uh, the environmental factors, such as precipitation and freezing index. And although this is a little more sophisticated than other empirical models, it is still empirical in the sense that this equation is also in the form of a regression equation and it does not involve the mechanistic simulation of the golden car. So what is finite layer? Uh, ViscoWave is the finite layer method that I've used for all the simulation, um, and I'll keep this discussion uh, pretty short. But ViscoWave is essentially a finite, uh, dynamic, axisymmetric finite layer solution uh, based on impulse coding and impulse responses. And it was initially developed for dynamic back calculation of the falling weight deflectometer time history. And in a, uh, and a few years ago, this program was upgraded to simulate the payment response under moving loads um, and incorporate both fixed point analysis as well as the moving frame analysis. 
So let's take a look at the look at these two different um, simulation methodologies. So first, under the fixed point analysis, the load is moving, but the deflection or the payment response is calculated at a fixed point in the payment. So if we come to this diagram on the right-hand side, the load is moving from here to here, but regardless of the location of the load, the payment response is simulated at this point that is fixed in the pavement. And it's not too difficult to visualize it if you just visualize any of the payment instrumentation um, in your head. It's, this is basically equivalent to what is measured by any of the instrumentation that is embedded in the pavement. And this is normally what we, we think and what we use when we talk about payment response under moving loads. Now, on the other hand, in the, under the moving frame analysis, load is moving and the deflection is calculated at points that move with the load. So again, in this diagram here, the load is moving from left to right, and the payment response is calculated at these points that travel with the load. And again, if you are familiar with any of, any of the traffic, traffic speed deflection devices, this analysis methodology is equivalent to what, uh, what, the T, what a TSDD is measuring um, uh, in terms of deflection, uh, because the deflection measuring sensors are mounted in the truck, um, not in the pavement, and those sensors travel with, with the truck, with the load. But when it comes to the analysis itself, this uh, methodology has not been used as commonly, um, although the theoretical idea um, has been around for, for quite a while. So this is the, here is the payment structure that I'll be using for, um, for all of the simulation. Um, it's basically a standard three-layer flexible pavement with 12 inches of asphalt concrete having a frequency-dependent or time-dependent dynamic modulus over a 12 inches of, of, of base material sitting on top of a fairly weak um, subgrade. And as for loading, unless um, stated otherwise, I will always be using a full axle having a total of 18 kep um, with, um, with dual tires. And the simulation and the vehicle speed for the simulation was fixed to 60 miles per hour. So let's take a look at um, uh, how, how the fixed point analysis and the moving frame analysis results may look like, starting with the fixed point analysis and consider the obvious case of a constant load, meaning there is no dynamic load. Um, so the so IRI is literally zero. There is no truck bounce whatsoever. So the load is moving uh, from left to right, and the load is basically a flat line because it is a constant load. And in the middle here at the location zero feet is where the fixed observation point is, and the payment deflection at that point, of course, would increase as the load approaches that point and would decrease as the load moves away from the fixed observation point. Now, if we consider the same constant load under the moving frame analysis, so again, the load is moving from left to right at a constant load, and let's consider only one moving observation point that is placed uh, directly below the load uh, in between the dual tires. and because the moving observation point is following the load, the deflection is also constant. And this is quite expected because the load is not changing, and we are assuming that the pavement is perfectly homogeneous, so there is no reason why this deflection should change. Okay, so let's see what happens if we plot these um, two together. So again, here the black solid curve shows you the payment deflection from the fixed point analysis, and the red straight line um, shows you the uh, payment deflection from the moving frame analysis. But if we zoom in to this area here, uh, these two curves intersect each other at location zero, and that is because that's when the tire 
is at location zero and both observation points from the from the respective methodologies are also at location zero feet. So if the axle as well as the observation points overlap uh, between the two analysis methodologies, they are producing identical results. So now let's consider a very simple um, dynamic load in the form of a sine curve. Um, the fixed observation point is still at location zero, and the peak of the sinusoidal loading is, lo is located on top of uh, the fixed observation point. And <clears throat> with the moving observation point, uh, in the previous example, I only considered one, but for, the, for this example, let's consider uh, a little more. Um, so a total of seven uh, moving observation points, uh, one placed uh, behind the axle and, and six of them placed in front of the axle. So again, this is what uh, the uh, payment deflection looked like from both the fixed point um, analysis me methodology as well as uh, the moving frame analysis methodology. Again, the black solid curve is the deflection uh, obtained from the fixed uh, 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 fixed point analysis. Now, all these sine curves are the payment deflections obtained from uh, the moving frame analysis. And if we look at the uh, sine curve at the bottom, that actually corresponds to the moving uh, moving observation point that is placed um, five feet in front of the axle. So when the axle location is at minus five, the moving observation point is five feet ahead of it, so it's actually at location zero. So again, the axle location and the moving observation points overlap between the two analysis methodologies, and we are getting identical results. And that statement holds true for all the other uh, moving uh, observation points. Now, another way to look at the results from the moving frame analysis is, say, to draw a vertical line at any location, uh, grab all these payment deflections or responses, and plot them against uh, the uh, plot them with respect to the sensor offset. And that results in what we call an instantaneous deflection basin. So these are the different uh, uh, instantaneous deflection basins um, obtained at every five feet uh, of the axle location. And you can see that it varies quite a bit compared to the black, uh, black curve in the middle, which corresponds to the deflection basin under a constant load. So let's take a talk a little bit about the, uh, some of the vehicle models. And uh, when I first started looking into um, uh, the vehicle dynamics modeling, uh, I, I was kind of overwhelmed um, by the amount of models um, and the variety of models that are out there, um, starting from uh, the most simple model that you can imagine all the way up to some of the very, very complicated truck filler models with um, linear and nonlinear suspension characteristics, as well as some frictional and horizontal um, uh, uh, forces. But we're not trying to develop a very sophisticated uh, vehicle um, simulator or, or, or 3D video games, but we'll stick to some of the simple vehicle models. And the first vehicle model um, that I'll show you is what is called a quarter truck model. It is the simplest uh, vehicle model uh, that I was able to find in the literature. And if you look at this diagram, the, the quarter truck model looks very, very similar to uh, uh, the golden car model that is used for IRI calculation. And I was able to find two different quarter truck models, one proposed by Dr. David Sibon at University of Cambridge um, in, in the UK and another quarter truck model by Dr. Todd uh, in the Mechani Mechanical Engineering Department at Penn State University. And regardless of these two different models, when we normalize everything uh, with respect to the sprung mass, uh, both these quarter truck models have 
um, stiffer suspension and, and weaker tire compared to, to the Golden Car model. And what goes into the vehicle model is the payment profile or the payment surface elevation um, as a function of distance. And I'll be using two different payment profiles, one having a very or, or a relatively smooth payment profile. And this payment profile was borrowed from the LTPP section 04-0261 Arizona. And it's smooth because the payment profile was collected right after uh, the payment was constructed in 1994. And the rough payment profile comes from the same LTPP section, but after 21 years of the pavement being, being in service. So it became pretty rough after 21 years, as you can uh, visually see by some of these uh, downward spikes that represent um, the payment deterioration. So let's see some demonstration using the rough pavement profile. <coughs> Excuse me. So in this animation here uh, is where the pavement profile is shown. This vertical line shows you where the quarter truck um, is located. Uh, these, this graph here shows you the uh, dynamic trace for both uh, uh, quarter truck models. This is how uh, Dr. Sibon's quarter truck model responds to the payment profile. The one down here is how the how Dr. Todd's quarter truck model responds uh, to the payment profile. And you can see the instantaneous deflection basin basin uh, bouncing up and down as the as the truck um, suspension um, is excited. Now the next vehicle model I'm going to show you is a three-dimensional truck, tra truck trailer model having 14 degrees of freedom. And when you're looking at this diagram, you may think this is oh, way too complicated, but it's still a relatively simple uh, model uh, because it does not include any of the nonlinear or frictional suspension characteristics. So all in all, this model is nothing but a bunch of masses interconnected um, through a bunch of linear springs and linear dash pods. Now, in the previous example, uh, I only showed you uh, the results from seven moving observation points, but with uh, this truck, tra truck trailer model, I decided to go a little extreme. So, I have placed <coughs> about 1,200 moving observation points in each wheel path spaced at every 0.1 uh, foot. So a total of 2,402 moving observation points. Um, and hopefully that'll give us the full picture of the payment response under this uh, truck trailer system. And in the previous example, um, I only focused on payment deflections, but the moving frame analysis can be extended to any payment response, um, such as uh, uh, such as stresses and strains. So in the next animation, I'll show you not only the uh, vertical payment deflection, but also the horizontal stress and strain that was calculated at the bottom of the asphalt concrete layer. <coughs> so I, this is a pretty busy animation, but then again, here is the rough LTPP payment profile. That dotted vertical line shows you where the steering axle, um, axle is located. Here's a rear view of the trailer. Here's the left, left and right half of the truck. And the next row shows you the payment deflection. So this is the deflection under the entire truck. And here are the deflections uh, zoomed in for, for each of these respective axles. And the next row shows you the horizontal, uh, the longitudinal uh, of stress at the bottom of the asphalt concrete. And the last row shows you the strains. And you can see that it, it bounces up and down quite a bit as the truck is excited by this uh, rough payment profile. Now, 
just so that I entertain you uh, for joining us um, um, for this webinar, I decided to go a little more extreme, and I only took one half of the uh, trailer axle and assumed a single tire. And under that single tire, I had placed uh, the moving observation point, uh, not only in the longitudinal direction, but also in the transverse direction, spaced at every 0.1 feet to an extent of plus minus 15 feet from the center of the load. And in part one of the webinar, I actually had uh, this written as plus minus 30. That is a mistake. Uh, so, uh, so I apologize for that. Just wanted to make sure I make that correction. But the bottom line is I, that I had placed a total of 90,600 moving observation points. Um, why am I doing this? Uh, because I wanted to visualize the payment deflection in 3D. That's what I'm about to show you. So let's take a look at the um, uh, payment deflection under uh, the constant load followed by uh, the dynamic load. So here is the uh, 3D visualization of the payment deflection under constant load. And because the load is constant, um, it's, the deflection is not changing regardless of the uh, uh, axle location. And when I first made this animation, because nothing was changing, it didn't look like an animation. It just looked like an image. Um, and, and, and that's why I decided to at least move the camera around, just to prove that this is an animation, not an image. Now, if we go to the dynamic load, um, here are two visualizations, 3D visualizations of the payment deflection. They're showing the same thing, except for that the one on the left shows you a tire uh, moving up and down to represent the dynamic load. The 2D plot on the left shows you the actual dynamic uh, load trace, and there's a little red dot um, showing you where the, where the axle is located. And the 2D plot on the right shows you the payment deflection along the longitudinal center line um, of, of the tire. And so, you, again, you can see that the uh, payment deflection or payment response varies quite a bit due to the dynamic load effect. Okay, so let's talk about mechanistic empirical IRI prediction. If you are in the uh, field of pavement engineering, you are probably dealing with all kinds of variability, um, whether you uh, whether you know or you don't. Um, and <clears throat> pavement profile, the surface elevation, uh, if you think about it, is nothing more than the variability caused in the pavement surface elevations. But then apart from the pavement profile, what else is variable? It's probably everything that is related to pavements, including the materials that make up the pavement, the construction um, um, application. Uh, there's a huge variability coming from the environment and even the traffic load um, that, uh, uh, that drives over, over the pavement. But then what about pavement distress? Is there is there variability in the measured pavement distress? Probably yes. For example, um, if one of you tells me that you had a quarter inch rutting in your pavement, you probably meant that the rutting on average was a quarter inch. It probably wasn't a quarter inch everywhere in the pavement. So we are uh, almost always focusing on uh, the mean values of the pavement uh, distress and we often over, overlook the variability associated with uh, the, the payment distress. So here's just a hypothetical um, example I'm going to show you just to prove a point. So let's consider a pavement profile that is perfectly flat except for this little bump here, which um, has a peak height of three quarters of an inch over a length of 15 feet. And if we calculate the IRI over this 500-foot uh, pavement section, it's actually pretty smooth. Um, it's 
So the IRI is only 31.1 inches per mile. Now, again, going back to our discussion, what is going to happen if this pavement uh, ruts a quarter inch everywhere without any variability? Well, and if that is the case, if it's running quarter inch everywhere, you start with uh, this pavement surface profile, and the rutted pavement surface profile would basically be the initial surface profile shifted down by a quarter inch because there is because we're assuming that there is no variability in in everything. Um, so even after a quarter inch. Uh, running in the pavement, we are still getting an IRI of 31.1 .1 inches per mile. And you probably would agree with me when I when I say that this is not very realistic. So the idea behind the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction is to take this initial surface profile, uh, put some vehicle um, vehicle loads, simulate the dynamic to simulate the uh, dynamic load that varies with uh, with distance, and and to calculate the spatially varying rut depth because the load was not constant, the rut depth is not constant either. It varies with distance, and we are going to use this spatially varying rut depth to update uh, the payment profile, and we will repeat this process until we get the distress history uh, that that we want. So this is the core idea behind the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction. So I'll be showing you four different um, case study examples. <coughs> um, and for all of the case study examples, um, I have used the payment ME rut depth model um, for um, for the asphalt concrete. So here's a pretty uh, complicated equation with, uh, but I've used the uh, just the global um, um, uh, calibration factors. But I have assumed uh, the temperature of the asphalt concrete to be constant at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And for the subgrade rutting, um, I decided to borrow. I wanted to keep it also. Uh, decided to borrow the uh, uh, empirical model that was uh, developed by Asphalt Institute um, several decades ago. And I'm going to uh, I'm going to show you the results uh, of the IRI and rut depth accumulation from zero to 20 million vehicle passes and the and to make this a little more efficient, uh, the payment profile was updated not at every pass of the vehicle, but at every 50,000 uh, vehicle passes. So here's the first case study example. Again, it's a payment profile with a single bump with an IRI of 31.1 .1 inch per mile. And we'll place the uh, place Dr. Sivan's quarter truck model and let's take a look at how this payment profile starts to deteriorate. So again, it started with this single payment profile. Now the pavement's starting to rut. And you can see that as the pavement starts to rut, you can see all these uh, 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 ups and downs in the payment profile outside the initial bump. So all these bumps are created as a result of what we call the roughness propagation. So let's take a look at the rut depth and IRI results. Um, so here on the left, I'm showing you the uh, the rut depth results from zero to 20 million vehicle passes uh, for, book, for the case with and without dynamic load. And you can kind of see that the two curves are almost on top of each other, not a significant difference in the rut depth. Um, and the IRI did not increase um, significantly. It started at 31.1, and then um, even after 20 million vehicle passes, it only went up to about 40.3 inch per mile. Now, in the second case study example, I'm going to consider a different kind of variability. So um, the 
initial payment surface profile was assumed to be perfectly flat. So the IRI was literally zero inch per mile. But um, instead of that bump, we're going to stimulate a patch. So over this 15 foot area, the asphalt concrete thickness was reduced uh, to six inches and where the rest of the asphalt concrete was 12 inches thick. So you can already imagine that, you know, this patched area here, having only one half the asphalt concrete would rust much, much faster. So let's see what happens when we put on the quarter cup model. Let's see how the pavement surface deteriorates. And again, you can see that the rutting is more significant in that uh, patched area. And you also see the uh, roughness, roughness propagation outside that, uh, outside the patched area. So again, coming back to the rut depth and IRI results, um, here are, here's the plot of the rut depth uh, with and without dynamic load. And for the rut depth, I excluded the uh, rut depth from the patched area just to be a little, a little more consistent. But then you can already see that the, when the dynamic load is considered, uh, the rut depth increases um, slightly. Uh, but then the IRI, although it started at zero, uh, it, went, it picked up pretty uh, quickly, and it, it, it went all the way up to about 94 inch per mile after uh, 20 million passes of the quarter truck model. Now in the third um, case study example, we'll come back to this initial pavement profile with a single bump. But instead of the quarter truck model, we'll place the 3D truck trailer model. And let's see how this pavement profile would deteriorate. So again, you see the effect of roughness propagation, and you can kind of see that it's pretty significant. And although I could have stopped uh, the simulation when the rut depth reached, I don't know, quarter inch or half inch, but this is uh, purely in, in simulation, so I just kept on kept on going um, to to see what happened. So again, the rut depth and IRI results. Um, here, the blue blue line shows you the rut depth accumulation when the dynamic load is not considered, and the when and when dynamic load is considered, um, it it starts. Uh, in a fairly linear fashion, but then it um, really starts to pick up um, and gets into the tertiary zone um, um, at around 20 million passes of the of the 3D truck trailer model. And when the and and, and at the end of the simulation, uh, the dynamic load uh, produced about 40 percent more more rotting, which is which I believe is significant. And, the, and then the IRI, although it started in a fairly linear fashion, as the as the rut started accumulating, it started picking up pretty fast. And because I didn't stop the simulation, it actually went all the way up to 1,000 inch per mile. And yes, you're right. This is not. This is probably not realistic if you're thinking um, thinking with me. Uh, but again. Um, we're assuming that no rehab has been done, um, and this is just all um, all simulation results. Now, in the last case study example, um, we will place this 3D truck trailer model on top of the smooth LTPP profile, and we'll also uh, look into um, uh, the spatially varying fatigue damage. And again, I didn't want to make this too complicated. I wanted to keep it simple, so I calculated the, the, the damage based on miners' hypothesis uh, with the uh, big N, um, or the allowable number of uh, load passes obtained from the pay, payment ME model. And the little n, of course, is the number of actual vehicle passes. And as the damage accumulates, um, I have assume that the asphalt concrete modulus reduces in a linear fashion um, in accordance to uh, the model proposed by Dr. Per Ulitz. So let's see how this LTPP payment profile starts to 
to deteriorate. So here is the uh, payment profile for the left wheel path and the right wheel path. And you can see uh, that, that as rutting progresses, the surface becomes more and more rougher. And at the bottom, that basically shows you how, how damage is accumulated um, over, um, um, over the uh, duration of stimulation. Coming back to rut depth and IRI results, um, the, when, when dynamic load was considered, um, it actually predicted about 10% more uh, rutting after 20 million passes of the vehicle. Um, but then the IRI um, increased in a gradual manner, but not non-linearly. So this is a non-linear increase in IRI, started at around uh, 40, 50 inch per mile for the respective wheel pads and, and went up to about 250 inch per mile at the end of the simulation. What about fatigue? So here, here are the um, curves for the fatigue damage, the red line showing you the fatigue damage when dynamic load is considered. And for reference purposes, this blue line shows you shows you the fatigue damage um, um, simulated without uh, the dynamic load. And you can see that the fatigue damage even at the end of the simulation was still less than 1.2%. Um, that's probably because we started with a very thick asphalt layer, con asphalt, asphalt concrete layer, um, uh, which was 12 inches thick. And there's probably other uh, modeling limitations and assumptions that didn't uh, didn't increase the fatigue damage as much as um, uh, as I wanted, but <clears throat> nonetheless, if uh, this trend um, starts if if this trend continues to grow like this until the pavement fails under fatigue damage, you can already see that there's going to be a significant effect because even at this low fatigue, even with the low fatigue damage, the, uh, the fatigue damage predicted with the dynamic load is almost double uh, the fatigue damage predicted without uh, the dynamic load. <coughs> so let's see how the mechanistic empirical um, IRI compares to the empirical IRI uh, and the and the Ashtoware IRI model. And again, this is the IRI empirical IRI model that is being used by Ashtoware Payment ME. Uh, but then in the previous slide, we discussed that the damage was negligible. So the effect of fatigue cracking is almost zero. And we assumed a constant temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So there is no thermal cracking. And because it was all simulated, um, there is no precipitation, and there is, and the freezing index is literally zero. So the effect of uh, the site factor is also quite negligible. So if you eliminate all of these three variables, the Ashtoware IRI model um, um, essentially becomes a linear function of the average rut depth. So again, these two nonlinear um, curves show you the IRI prediction from the mechanistic empirical simulation, and these flat line um, at the bottom shows you the empirical um, IRI prediction from the Ashtoware um, IRI model. And you can see that they are quite different. So to summarize, the empirical IRI prediction models, they do not involve the mechanistic golden car simulation, and they are mostly based on, on regression type uh, of models with a limited number of inputs. But then they are simple, they're easy, um, they're easy to use, and they're definitely efficient. But then if you want to uh, have a very reliable, reliable um, empirical IRI model for the entire pavement network, 
you may need to develop the IRI models for different uh, payment thickness ranges, different foundations, different regions, um, and different climate zones, and, and, and et cetera. And of course, because of the nature of the empirical IRI prediction models, um, even after the model is developed, it, it, you may have to go through some extensive calibration for them to be reliable. Now, on the other hand, the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction requires the mechanistic simulation of the golden car. That's why it is mechanistic empirical IRI prediction. And uh, it uses a spatially varying rut depth uh, for updating the payment profile. Um, <clears throat> and it may provide a better means for incorporating the, some of the other structural characteristics, such as the modulus of different layers and the thickness of the different layers um, in I prediction. But then the drawback of the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction is that it's not that simple. Um, it's not that easy to use compared to the empirical models, and it is definitely not efficient. Um, <laughs> And again, the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction, the, probably the biggest drawback of the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction is that it probably cannot be used during the payment design phase, at least as of today. And, that, and the primary reason is that during the design phase, the payment is not even constructed, so the payment profile um, is, is probably not available for simulation. But then there have been some other approaches to overcome this. Uh, for example, Dr. Per Ulitz had looked into something like this in the in the 1980s, and he said he actually said that um, a stochastic or a probabilistic approach um, uh, may need to be uh, uh, brought in if this type of methodology is to be used in the uh, during the payment design phase. And of course the uh, uh, of course, the efficiency of the simulation will become become a challenge. But then there's probably some other um, uses, uh, some other uses where the mechanistic empirical IRI prediction can be can be used. For example, uh, it cannot be used during the design phase, but when the payment is constructed, maybe it can it could become a tool for verifying uh, your design assumptions. And there are other research studies that have uh, have showed that uh, payment smoothness affects uh, the vehicle fuel consumption and the greenhouse gas emissions. So maybe this is another tool that can be used for predicting the uh, uh, fuel efficiency or the greenhouse um, gas emission over the life cycle um, of the pavement. But then uh, there's probably a lot of future uh, research that need to be done before this thing becomes um, becomes a standard for everyday use. For example, uh, there is a golden car for calculating the IRI, but there, then there is no golden truck for simulating the dynamic load. And then um, in, in, in this presentation, I've used the spatially varying rut depth for updating the payment profile and, and the IRI accumulation, but then there are other distresses um, that affect the, the ride quality, such as cracking and raveling on the, on the payment profile. So this is just a brief conclusion out of uh, both part one and part two of the webinar series. Um, again, if you are in the field of payment engineering, you are probably dealing with variability on a daily basis. And if that variability, whether it's the dynamic load or the payment thickness or the modulus, if that variability affects the payment response, it will affect payment performance. And, and moving dynamic load is just another form of variability that will affect both the payment response and perform. With that, I would like to thank you for, for your attention. Thank you for listening. And I will turn it back to Jerry.
Gary? Let me thank you, uh, Young. Let me apologize first, everyone, for the little beeping distraction. You're probably going to hear beeps for a little bit, but it'll go away, I assure you. Some little <laughs> problem with Cisco. We'll, uh, we'll repair that. So I've got a few things to cover in the next 10 minutes uh, with you. First of all, uh, I'm going to share with you what the up-and-coming webinars are. We try to, in our programs, diversify the topics. We're, uh, for the next series, September through November, We've got three unique topics that are really related to pavements. That's not always our theme, but uh, you can see we usually uh, host the programs in the third week of the month. Uh, and those of you who are beeping off, try and stick with us until the end, and I'll tell you why in a minute. If you're interested in registering for any of these programs, uh, please look at the website, ARA.com, products and webinars, and you'll get enough direction to give the guidance that you have. Next slide, please. Well, we've got a number of questions, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about several of these as we go along. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that questions are welcome. We're running a little long today, so we may not get to all the questions that have been asked. But all of these programs are recorded, and Dr. Lee has been gracious, like most of our presenters. And I'll entertain questions via email that you see on slide 64 right here uh, if we don't get to your particular question during the program. And uh, let's talk a little bit about the questions that we have thus far. So, uh, question from uh, Avon, uh, I might have missed the introductory part of the program, so I apologize if it's already been covered, but uh, what's the difference between the AASHTO Ware and the ME model? Pavement practitioners use these terms interchangeably. Could you, could you repeat the last portion of the question? Yeah, Gary? they want to, basically they would like to know the difference between AASHTO Ware and the ME model. Uh, that and, and pavement practitioners use those terms interchangeably, or to say the question another way, is there a difference between the Ashto Ware model and the current ME model? Yeah, the the ME here in uh, pavement ME also stands for mechanistic empirical. So it's a mechanistic empirical pavement design or an analysis tool. Um, but then the uh, IRI model that is embedded in payment ME is is purely empirical uh, because it looks um, like this, um, and it's it's an so the mechanistic portion of payment ME is, is in calculating the rut depth, uh, fatigue cracking, transverse cracking, but then when it comes to the IRI prediction itself, it goes back to the empirical model. So it's and it so. Okay, um, and we probably, I could tell you right now, we won't get through all the questions during the allotted time. So we, again, if we don't reach your question, please, uh, if you've submitted it already or you have questions after the fact, which we entertain questions up to two days after the presentation. So by this Friday close of business, Young would be more than happy to receive questions. So Kim asked the question, Young, how does the Visco wave compare to 3D move to the 3D MOVE program developed at University of Nevada at Reno? Oh, that's a very um, interesting question. Um, this was one of the hidden slides I had, um, and the uh, 3D MOVE is probably another variant of the finite layer method in the sense that each layer um, or sub-layer be essentially becomes an element, and now, both ViscoWave and 3D, 3D Move can simulate uh, moving uh, dynamic loads, but the core difference is that ViscoWave was developed um, in the time domain, and 3D Move was developed in the frequency domain. And what that means is that ViscoWave um, can handle both uh, FWD and moving loads, whereas 3D Move can only handle uh, moving loads. Um, and I, unless I'm mistaken, in the 3D Move program, there's a, a static mode of simulating the SWD. 
uh, but then um, it's not dynamic uh, and viscoelastic anymore. But then uh, the advantage of 3D move when it comes to moving load simulation is that it probably is much faster than visco wave. Um, so, and it's it and just personally, uh, 3D. Another advantage of the 3D move is that it has a pretty beautiful looking user oh. interface, whereas visco wave doesn't have a user interface. So. <laughs> okay. Um, and we, we only got a, a few minutes left. Um, Richard asked the question of, will the recording be available? I'll get to that, Richard, and everybody in a moment. But one more technical question, Young, if well, we can manage that with the time allotted. Ryan sure. asked the question, it looks like different truck models produce different results. Could you comment on that? Uh, yes. Uh, that basically goes back to the case study example number one and number three. So if you look at case study example number one, this is just a quarter truck, not a very super heavy truck. It's just a 9,000 pound total static load. And you can see that the rut depth went from zero to about 0.12 inches. Not a big difference, uh, even when the dynamic load is considered. But when we go to example number three, this, we start with the same payment profile, but we put a pretty heavy um, truck trailer system. So this is equivalent to one, two, three, four um, quarter truck models going over it, um, roughly speaking, of course. But then you see a drastic difference in the rut depth. Um, so uh, the rut depth is not 0.1 anymore. At the end of the simulation, we're talking over half inch um, rutting. And of course, you can change the uh, truck model and it'll prop really produce different results, completely different results. So, okay. Um, go ahead. Um, would you please move to slide 65? I've got a few more items to sure. cover here. And I did, we didn't get to everybody's questions. So uh, as I mentioned before, what the process will be, Young will be getting back to you with questions submitted. And then uh, we w you are welcome to submit questions. Because some people have a hard time chewing gum, walking, and sending questions into webinars. So uh, a couple of you have asked about P, uh, PDH certificates. And first of all, I want to thank everybody again on behalf of myself, ARA, and Dr. Lee. Uh, this program is being recorded as all ARA webinars are recorded. If you'd like um, to receive a copy of, and that, those recordings are posted uh, about three days or so, maybe a little bit longer after the fact. If you'd like a PDH certificate uh, or a copy of the presentation, and that's a P PDF version of today's presentation, go to ARA webinars at ARA.com. Now, just to be in, in compliance with the licensing boards, if you sign on to the webinar and you would like a PDH certificate, you need to attend the entire program. So uh, people have a lot of follow-up calls, if you sign off and we kind of know when you've logged on and when you log off, just to make sure we're in compliance with the regulatory boards, we will not be able to grant you a certificate unless you are on the entire program. So I think everybody understands that. Next slide, please. Okay, we're almost there, gang, and we're almost out of time. So we're always looking for great people. ARA has approximately 50 offices. I happen to work in one of our satellite offices in Delaware, and we're about 1,500 uh, employees, so we're a national company. If you're interested in employment opportunities with us, uh, please send uh, your brief resume and your contact information to the website that you see listed here on this particular slide. So thank you again. And thank you, Young, for part one and part two. You did an excellent job. Everybody stay safe, and God bless you all. Have a great day. Thank you, Jerry.